Pittsburgh, the resilient city, right? You know, the city has gone through many types of changes. And we're going to go through a quick history lesson today and then sort of <clears throat> understand where we're at today and where we need to be to tomorrow. Um, the city was burned to the ground in the 19th century. It had been flooded numerous times. It went through economic collapse, but it somehow always came back. That was 1754. The French came here. They said, hello, we are here. This is as far as the new world will go. And a little bit later, it was taken over by the British. And um, it's kind of interesting because we fought the First World War for this little treasured piece of land. Uh, the Seven-Year War, the French and Indian War, was a battle that had begun right here in western Pennsylvania and spread throughout the world. Pittsburgh became a fortress, a little western frontier town. That's what we were. You know, the, the resiliency factors were plagues, floods, uh, attacks by Native Americans, and we prepared and built a little fortress in order to be able to handle all of that. But very soon, a couple of guys would get in a boat, one of them right down by Heinz Field, named Lewis and Clark, and they would discover Ohio. No, they discovered the rest of the country, right? Manifest destiny, ocean to ocean. And they looked over their shoulder and they said, who's going to build it? And Pittsburgh, of course, Pittsburgh. And before it was steel, it was glass and then iron, then steel, then aluminum. And Pittsburgh built America. From this little fortress town came this industrial giant. And what came with that? Air that was dangerous to breathe. Water that was poisonous to drink. And the greatest disparity between the have and the have-nots in American history. And I really like this slide because it reminds me every day what would have happened if Frick and Carnegie hadn't hated each other. The school would have been known as Carnegie, Frick, and Mellon. <laughs> Pittsburgh grew like we were the boom town. We were like population doubling each decade, more and more people coming. All these immigrants, no walls. And we built this city. More importantly, we not only built the city, we built the middle class as a process of it. We went to work. We started to solve the problems of the bad air. The first Clean Air Act in American history, decades before there would even be an EPA. Pittsburghers rolled up our sleeves and we partnered corporate Pittsburgh with government in order to be able to solve our pollution. Corporate Pittsburgh with government in order to be able to solve the issues we had with our water and working in those mills and organizing in order to end the disparity and make it a Pittsburgh for all. But there were other things that we were doing at the same time that were really taking away from the heart of this region, from the city. This is a beautiful shot of the north side and within 10 years it looked like that. We took big wrecking balls and took it through East Liberty and took it through the Hill District and took it through the North Side. We invested billions of dollars in tunnels and bridges and we saw our city change. But then came 1979. The city that had once been an industrial giant was now the third largest corporate center in America. New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh. And in 1979, the Pirates won the World Series. The Steelers won their fourth Super Bowl in six years. And Pittsburgh died. We died. Our entire economy that we had put in through heavy industry was gone. That city that was booming and growing and doubling every 10 years started a downward trend that would last 70 years of population loss. We would lose more people in the 80s than New Orleans lost after Hurricane Katrina, and they never came back. Our unemployment was greater than it was during the Great Depression. At 19%, triple what Detroit's is today. And our debt ratio of our city, of our government, higher than New York City's when it went bankrupt. But we're Pittsburghers. What do we do? We rolled our sleeves up and we started to get to work. We started to working together with government and the corporate community, our foundations, our nonprofits, 
are large institutions. A very interesting study that came out in that time. Number one thing we have to do, reinforce the region's traditional economic base as a center for metals industry and corporate headquarters. The corporate headquarters continued to leave, the metals industry continued to diminish. Convert underutilized land, facilities, and labor force components to new uses, especially those involving advanced technology. The seeds were planted. What would happen during the 80s and the 90s is the mills never really left. It just moved up the hill. And they were called Carnegie Mellon, the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, Allegheny Health Networks. Enhance the region's quality of life, thereby attracting new residents and increasing tourism. Don't give up on the arts and culture. Double down. This is our time to make sure that we don't lose any of those great things we had 100 years ago and we're able to give the next generation something more. Expand opportunities for women, minorities, and structurally unemployed. Well, we still got a lot of work to do on that one. So this is the Pittsburgh of today. We did a lot of heavy, heavy lifting when it came to investment. We built a state-of-the-art airport, then we tore it down and built a state-of-the-art airport. We built state-of-the-art stadiums, and we tore them down and built state-of-the-art stadiums. We built a brand new convention center, then tore it down and built a brand new convention center. So that stuff's done, right? We don't have to worry about that for at least another 30 years. So we have to start thinking, what is it that we invest in and how do we do it? The arts and the culture that was invested in the 80s, the place that we're standing and sitting in today, the entire cultural district was all done by partnerships. It never happened alone. It wasn't that one group did it, it was that all groups took a certain part to make sure that it would happen. It was groups like the foundation community that did more than just hold our head above the water while we were treading water, that they helped to build this wonderful city that we have today. And it was these institutions that would become the engines of a new economy that were born during the 90s and the 80s through ideas that people had of planting seeds and watching to see where they would go. So this is where we stand. Today we're on the cusp of the next great Pittsburgh, from that fortress town to the city that became an industrial giant, to the transformation to a corporate city, to its economic collapse, we're now at that critical next phase. A resilient city, the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kind of chronic, chronic stresses in acute shocks they experience. A resilience strategy for the city of Pittsburgh. The city of Pittsburgh has been selected as one of the 100 cities on earth to be part of the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 resilient cities. Learning and working from cities around this world, we've put together a strategy that we've partnered with the RAND Corporation in presenting. Our strategy is one that looks at the next 30 years and identifies the shocks and the stresses and says, what can we do to maybe not eliminate them, but to make sure that their impacts never knock us down like we got knocked down before. We put it through a filter that we call P4. Economics of the 19th century are based on a single bottom line of profit. Cities of the 21st century have a quadruple bottom line of people, place, planet, and performance. All four have to be the metric which we measure our success by and our investment in. We looked at Pittsburgh's areas. We went out into the community to be able to understand it more fully. The shocks that we will face, the impacts that will happen, infrastructure collapse. You're seeing it with PWSA. You're seeing it with our bridges, our roads. We have to do more and invest more in it. Climate change and extreme weather. What we used to call 50-year storms or 100-year storms now happen on a yearly basis. Homes and entire neighborhoods are flooded. We don't have the capacity of a sewer system to even be able to handle it. Hazmat accident. We have crude oil going through the heart of this city multiple times a day. Just one mishap could be a disaster or a catastrophe, or it could happen up in Oakland at one of the hospitals or one of the university labs, and we have to be prepared. What do we do if we have to quarantine an entire part of our city for 60 days, 90 days, 120 days? 
economic collapse. We went through it once and we weren't prepared. How do we prepare ourselves for something that might happen outside of our own economics, something on a national or a global scale? And then the stresses. What's happening day by day by day that we can help to mitigate, eliminate, or at least be able to minimize impact? Our environmental, environmental degradation. We have a long history of being able to address it, but we're still far way behind other cities and regions. Economic and racial inequity. We don't have a black middle class in the city of Pittsburgh. We have poor and wealthy, and we have to be provide opportunities, ladders of opportunities for these jobs of the future that are being created so that everyone has a place in, Pencil or in Pittsburgh's future. Aging infrastructure, as we talked about, and fragmentation, the most fragmented governmental structure in the USA. We're number one. And how does that break down into these four areas that we put everything in with P4. Well, with the planet, it's how we address our issues with water, our local and renewable energy. Understanding that the idea of having a power plant 100 miles away, producing energy off of fossil fuel, going along an energy line, losing the majority of the energy that was used to make it so that you can toast your toast in the morning is an antiquated idea. In the future, cities will produce their own energy. They'll be done in microgrids. There won't be a major grid, it'll be small grids. It will be producing with renewable energy and renewable sources. We already see it happening. We've created a biosphere, an opportunity for a neighborhood that has no grocery store to be able to grow fish, tilapia, grow vegetables, all being done and powered by the sun and rainwater. Nothing plugged in, no pipes, no, no attachments. In, in 2,000 examples where it's being used with direct current energy, only five in the United States. And one of them is in Homewood. How do we work with people? It's on housing and affordable housing options. The opportunity to take 17,000 blighted properties that the city of Pittsburgh owns because they had no market value in the past and turn it into an opportunity for someone to call it home be able to turn it over and have workforce development programs in that neighborhood and teaching people how to become electricians, teaching people how to become roofers, teaching people how to become plumbers, and one by one taking each of the properties back and not only giving somebody an opportunity for affordable housing, but somebody the opportunity to own their own home. We look at transportation, mixed uses, vacant land, green space, all the different opportunities within a public space, and we start to think about how we can enhance it, enhance a neighborhood, and make a city more resilient by taking out that big paved parking lot and putting in a field that retains rainwater so it never gets to the pipe so you don't have to spend a billion dollars to replace the pipe. By using ideas of how that can enhance a city's health, its ability for cleaner air, its ability to be a global leader in understanding that revitalization combined with sustainability can help to create a city that becomes resilient. And each of these have a different way of being enacted. It's not just like city government sits down and works with this group and gets it done. There's different ways to be able to approach it in order to be able to see it succeed. Initiate, develop and implement new initiatives. Things that aren't there in the past that need to be there. Great example, summer of earn and learn. 2013, we employed 150 kids in summer employment. Most of them cut grass or painted fences. 2014, four months in office, we expanded it to 600 kids, and they worked at PNC Bank, UPMC, the University of Pittsburgh, and throughout this city. We did it by doing it on our own, using community development block grant dollars to fund it. The next year, we realized for every kid we gave a summer job to, we told two, we don't have a job for you. So we partnered with the county. We partnered with our corporate community and we partnered with our foundations. And that next year we had 2,000 kids working all throughout the city and this county, doing things and learning about careers, taking voice lessons at the University of Pittsburgh where children had never been on a college campus and saying, this is where I wanna go to school. And then the next year, we partnered with the Children's Museum. We partnered with Carnegie Library, Carnegie Museums. We partnered with Pittsburgh Public Schools Summer Dreaming. 
and we had 16,000 kids involved in learning and education programs during the summer. From 150 to 16,000 in three years because we did it the Pittsburgh way. We partnered. Yesterday we announced our goal for this summer, 27,000. Coordinate, just as I had said, working together and being able to pull the resources together. Amplify, things that are already there that you want to be able to do more with and accelerate those initiatives that are already there or on the drawing table and getting them moving out the door. Some of our partners, because we're working on a global basis, involve companies from around the world, but we're also now getting Pittsburgh companies involved in the other 100 cities in every continent on Earth. And we're working it together so that Pittsburgh's resiliency plan becomes a plan for every other city to follow. As we reemerge on the global stage, we want the example of how Pittsburgh can work together and to do things to be a model that all cities can see. So it doesn't matter who's serving in Washington. It doesn't matter who's in Harrisburg. In Pittsburgh, we roll our sleeves up, we work together, and we get the job done. And that's how it connects. A smart city that utilizes technology and new investment and creates new markets that don't even exist in the world. A sustainable city that understands the importance of making it so that it lasts and making sure that it has a very minimal impact on the environment. And a resilient city that puts it all together so that it will be here way after the time that we're gone for the ones who will follow. Why? Local governments must solve problems. The idea that federal programs will come in and save us is gone. The idea that this can all be solved on a global level or on a, on a federal level is gone. Cities around the world right now can end the refugee crisis. Mayors around the world will each take a certain amount of people that we can host and bring to safety. And if the cities around the world led it, we wouldn't have a crisis. Cities around the world can affect climate change. We each lower our carbon footprint, be able to do more at a local level, and we can do more than what federal governments can do. There are all these different areas where we have the ability to make these great changes, but it really is because of the way the world is right now that the solutions to these problems are on a local level. And in Pittsburgh, our district energy plan is already taking off creating with our new developments the energy to sustain them. 178 acres down in Hazelwood with the foundation community that will be powered 100% by renewable energy on site. The 28 acres around the Penguins PPG Paints Arena will all be powered on site with natural gas. Areas around the city where we're putting in eco-innovation districts like in Uptown in order to be able to pull all the components together at a community level basis. And Pittsburgh's becoming a world leader in this as well. In the next steps, Pittsburgh Survey 2.0. 1908, Pittsburgh is at its crisis. It is economically one of the strongest cities and regions in the world. And it has, as I said before, air that was dangerous to breathe, water that was poisonous to drink, and the greatest disparity in American history between the haves and the have-nots. The Pittsburgh survey, survey was the first socioeconomic study of a city ever done on Earth. And it uncovered all the problems that were there and gave about solutions. It's time for Pittsburgh Survey 2.0. And we're working with Rand Corporation and Brookings in order to present that during this next year and over the course of the next several years. And what it will do is it will provide us, not only with a plan, but it will measure how, if we're being successful. Because if you aren't measuring, you're only practicing. Pittsburgh Investment Prospectus. How much would it cost to give every three and four year old in the city of Pittsburgh an education? Not daycare, an education. Every three and four year old having the opportunity to be able to start out in kindergarten at the same starting line hearing the same number of words, having a vocabulary that was equal, being able to have cognitive abilities that are all the same. And then what would that mean at the kindergarten level? Then what would it mean at the third grade level? Then what would that mean by sixth grade? And those kids that start dropping out at seventh grade, the ones that you read about in the papers when they're 16, the ones that are in prison by the time they're 18, how many more of them would then have an opportunity to be a success 
if we just invest it. But what's the cost going to be? So let's say it's $20 million. Is it worth the city then to invest $5 million if we can get the school to invest $5 million? Would there be a foundation in town that would be willing to contribute $5 million? How about one corporation to be a sponsor? All of a sudden now we have every third and fourth year old having that education and changing an entire generation. That's what the community investment perspective is. It's the opportunity to see what the value will be and then help to get the Pittsburgh way done where we all take a little part of it, a part of the responsibility, we roll up our sleeves and we get to work. From a western frontier town to an industrial giant, to the renaissance that brought about the corporate city, to the economic collapse, to the rebuild that we've seen over these past 30 years, to where we stand today. You can bomb a city, you can burn a city to the ground. You can flood a city. You can rip the economic heart out of a city. But a city will always come back if you invest in its people.